He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. These are the last few hours of Jane's life as we know it. Um, Danny went with the taxi driver to um, do a few errands. Amanda got picked up and um, taken off for a job and Jane was left on the street and where she went after that, nobody knows. Kia ora and welcome back to another season of Crimes NZ. I'm Jesse Mulligan, I host RNZ's daily afternoon show and in this series I talk to people who have been closely involved in one way or another with some of New Zealand's most serious crimes. Like in this episode, it's the mysterious cold case of Auckland teenager Jane Furlong. The young sex worker went missing from Karangahape Road in 1993. Stuff journalist Kelly Dennett is the author of The Short Life and Mysterious Death of Jane Furlong, a book that won Best Nonfiction at the 2019 Nio Marsh Awards, and which Kelly partly wrote while doing a week-long writer's residency at the Surrey Hotel. I really turned out lots and lots of um, lots of words, but also more importantly, I had more time to kind of sit down with some of my interviewees and do some more research and and really get invested without having to think about um, anything else, really. Yes, because the proximity of the Surrey Hotel is quite close to K Road. You must have felt like you were really on the scene. I did, and actually, one of the reasons that I applied for um, the residency was because one of the key characters in the book, uh, Jane's boyfriend at the time, Danny, he had visited the Surrey hotel on the night that she had disappeared so it was all sort of linked and obviously K Road's only um, probably less than a K away from the hotel so it was the perfect setting. So let's go back to the beginning who was Jane Furlong? So Jane as you mentioned um, was very young when she disappeared in 1993 she was a teenager just 17 and uh, she was a, a new mother, a young mother. Her uh, son, Aidan, was just a few months old when she disappeared. Uh, and she was a daughter and a sister and a friend. She was uh, working on K Road when she went missing. And by all accounts, she was a very vivacious, extremely bright, um, energetic person um, whose disappearance has really left a, a mark on, on the people who knew her. And so young, so young, so young too. I, I, it's hard to fathom um, the lifestyle that Jane was sort of leading at the time that she went missing, 17. It was, it was hard for me to relate to, and it was, yeah, certainly difficult to imagine who would have harmed her. Only 20 years ago, really, uh, or 25 years ago, but K Road was quite different than it is today. Yeah, I mean, K Road today is... is potentially sort of an edgier a part of town. Um, lots of interesting characters on the street and lots of sort of funky stores and things, but my understanding is that in the early 90s it was um, a hive of activity. One of the taxi drivers that I spoke to who um, you know, went up and down the street frequently said, you know, cars were bumper to bumper, crowds were on the streets and uh, this was before sort of sex work was legalised so there was sort of lots of kind of nefarious activity and there were parlours and and brothels and people walking the streets and lots of bars and nightclubs and it sounded like a very sort of energetic, almost sort of dark place to be at the time. How did she get into the world of sex work being so young? So Jane uh, was sort of living away from home at the time, um, which again is quite hard to imagine considering her age, but she and uh, some friends had sort of various leases on flats and they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, They also sort of didn't really have reliable access to vehicles at the time, so Jane and her friends were often hitchhiking. And uh, Jane later told a good friend of hers that while she was hitchhiking one afternoon, uh, the driver had offered her some money to perform a sex act. And the way that Jane related it to her friend at the time, it was sort of like, oh my goodness, you know, a chance to make some, some good money. And it sort of was good money back then. So for someone who wanted to be really independent and was living away from home and um, had sort of had, a, I guess, a bit of a troubled upbringing. It was, to her, um, it seemed like the perfect solution to making a bit of cash, and, and that was how it started, really. So tell us uh, what happened on the day she disappeared. What do we know? So Jane was living with her partner, Danny, at the time. Um, her son was living with family, and because Jane tended to work uh, quite late nights, uh, she would spend most of the day sleeping 
Uh, she'd just moved into a new flat in Onihanga with her partner, Danny, and um, my understanding was sort of they slept most of the day and she kind of potted around the house a little bit, sort of putting things together. And by the early evening, they had travelled to a friend of theirs' home in Penrose and uh, they then had a taxi driver drop the three of them so Jane, Amanda and Danny, onto K Road. I believe it was around 8, 8.30 at night. Sort of this, these are the last few hours of Jane's life as we know it. Um, Danny went with the taxi driver to um, do a few errands. Amanda got picked up and um, taken off for a job and Jane was left on the street and where she went after that, nobody knows. Yeah, and therein lies the mystery. When did police, or when were police alerted? Well, Danny, after realising that Jane um, was missing from K Road, so Danny and Amanda had both returned to K Road to this particular spot where they um, often work just outside the, the rental store. After realising that Jane had been away for a while and didn't appear to be returning, Danny went to the Auckland Central Police Station that evening to report her missing and was turned away, basically, I guess. In those days, it was sort of like, well, we need to wait and see if she'll turn up, and I guess she lived a somewhat transient lifestyle at the time, so it was it was a possibility that she would turn up anyway. So he was told to come back in 48 hours, which he did, and by that time it was heading into the weekend, and the file wasn't... Uh, taken to detectives until the following Monday, by which time Jane had been gone for about five days. And is that probably unsurprising, given how, um, well, given the police view, maybe in the society view of sex workers, that um, not necessarily that they were of less value, but that, that maybe this sort of unexpected behaviour was more normal or, or more to be expected? Yeah, I think it was, from reading the earlier news reports after Jane's disappearance, it seemed that the police had taken the view that she had possibly taken herself off um, to, I don't know, get some R&R, I suppose. But the reality was Jane had a young son, she had a partner, she had some good friends, she had plans for later on in the evening, and her disappearance was unusual. She was also in quite close contact with the police at the time because she was due to give evidence in a court case. So arguably she was a vulnerable witness who was working out on the street. So it's a bit surprising that police didn't act the day that Danny walked into the police station that evening. Uh, We've got some archived RNZ audio from Morning Report on the 24th of May 1994. Thanks to the team at Ngātanga Sound and Vision for this. Here it comes. It's a year today since teenage prostitute Jane Furlong disappeared from Auckland's Karangahape Road. The Prostitutes Collective says sex workers have learned some valuable lessons since her disappearance. Glenda Wakem reports. Detectives believe the 17-year-old's met with foul play and is probably dead. Police are still receiving information about the case but have no strong leads on what happened to Jane Furlong. The teenager's bank account hasn't been touched since May 1993 and her baby son, who was six months old at the time, is being cared for by his father's parents. The Prostitutes Collective's National Coordinator, Catherine Healy, says since Jane's disappearance, prostitutes have been issued with some common-sense advice about potentially dangerous clients. just in fact made a a video and we talk about security in respect of hopping into strange cars um, with unknown clients and letting somebody else document your movements like taking the registration number of the car for instance and making sure that you leave a set of fingerprints on the inside of the car. Catherine Healy believes prostitutes are more security conscious now than they were a year ago. I think they're ever mindful that perhaps their next client could create a problem for them Certainly these situations happen from time to time and, you know, a lot of the community do know the clients that they're dealing with and they certainly know the men that they should be keeping well clear of as well and they've contributed to building up the Ugly Mugs list, which is a list that's put out by the collective to gather information on problematic clients. Uh, so that's Glenda Wakeham, who, by the way, still works here at RNZ on 1990, does a fantastic job as well, uh, reporting on the Jane Furlong disappearance one year on. Were media interested in her disappearance at the time, Kelly? 
Yeah, they certainly were. And, you know, I'm by no means the first journalist who who took an interest in in Jane's life and her disappearance. Uh, And there was a lot of media attention at the time. You know, she was a young, um, beautiful woman and there was sort of an element of mystery and danger And there had also been a lot of publicity around a series of attacks made on sex workers sort of in the year before Jane had disappeared by a particular sort of rich businessman who was, I guess, frequenting the area. So it had all created a a little bit of a buzz about the danger of the street at the time. And, uh, of course, her photo was pretty widely used in media coverage uh, and, and pretty memorable too. Yeah, she was very striking looking, very sort of, you know, beautiful, bright red hair and that photograph was sort of dispersed across the country and actually there was lots of reports of possible sightings of her up and down the country but um, none of them were verified at the time. Um, But yeah, certainly that photograph is, um, I think it's on the cover of the book now and it's, it's one of, you know, a lot of people who I've talked to have said, oh, you know, the name doesn't really ring a bell but actually I remember that photo so Mm. were there any suspects there were lots of suspects um, or lots of persons of interest anyway or lots of possibilities Um, just because there were so few leads about where she disappeared to it was possible that you know someone had pulled her into a car or maybe she had had a job with a stranger or perhaps a friend of hers had seen her on the street and she'd gone off with them there were so many possibilities Uh, one of the strongest possibilities that had been canvassed repeatedly was uh, the gentleman who I mentioned before who had been attacking sex workers on the street. Jane had made a complaint about him and was due to give evidence at a trial, you know, sort of after her disappearance. And so that seemed like the more obvious answer at the time. Um, He was actually in custody, however, so in my books that sort of ruled him out quite strongly. Uh, The police looked uh, quite heavily at her partner at the time And, you know, there are a couple of other friends who, you know, Jane's associates weren't sort of the squeakiest clean of people. And so I know that there was, um, there were quite a few people that the police had in mind. And so what happens um, with the investigation? Did it just sort of peter out? Um, You know, what, what happened over the next sort of year or two? It sort of did in a way. Um, there were lots of media reports at the time with, at first the police were sort of imploring Jane to, to come home or let people know that she was OK, which sort of struck me as strange. And then um, obviously when she never came home, um, the investigation sort of ramped up a little bit. But nothing really happened. A year went by and she was still missing um, and sort of the coverage died out a little bit. And then a breakthrough. Yes, so in 2012, um, a dog walker walking along Sunset Beach in Port Waikato, which is, you know, miles away from Auckland City. It's in very, very south Auckland, um, very remote spot. A dog walker found what looked like a skeleton in the sand dunes, and the police were called, and pretty quickly the remains there were identified as Jane. And anything found, I mean, did it, did it look as if the body had been left there way back in the early 90s or, or something more recent? No, I think uh, the the prevailing view was that the, the skeleton had been there for a long time. The dunes at Sunset Beach, I mean, they're incredible. Um, the wind there is crazy and the dunes have slowly been eroded and eroded and eroded until, you know, someone's secret has finally been revealed. So um, she was buried sort of quite close to some houses, actually, and sort of not too far from the car park and the former Life Saving Club. Uh, so the understanding was that she'd been there for, for quite some time. And did, did anything about the find give police any clues? I mean, the police have always kept... Uh, pretty close to their chest, you know, what they found with um, Jane's remains. That information is uh, sort of confidential, uh, sort, of, sort of weed out false confessions, I suppose. Uh-huh. But, I mean, it was a huge discovery in that, first of all, it confirmed that Jane had met with foul play. Uh, second of all, the location was extremely interesting. It's such a remote spot, yeah. such an unusual place to bring someone. 
and third of all, it, it initiated, you know, a lot more coverage. You know, there was renewed interest in the case. Uh, there were heaps of phone calls and tips flooding in and sort of, uh, I guess, the, the investigation was reinvigorated. I had another piece of audio to play here. This is from RNZ at the time when the body was found. It's Mary Wilson talking to uh, the police officer leading the investigation. Detective Inspector Mark Benefield is leading the investigation into Jane Furlong's killing. He's spoken with her family about the discovery of her remains. It puts an end to that wait for them all, and also, sadly, it's uh, the, the bit of, that last bit of hope is gone. Uh, Mum was quite... Well, she took it quite well, actually. I think she prepared herself. We'd spoken to her when there was a little bit of media attention on it um, shortly after the find, and we went and had a chat saying uh, we needed to... Uh, confirm the identity through uh, positive identity rather than just speculation and uh, she, she was well prepared for it. Does the discovery give you any clues? Uh, well we have a body that's the start and, we, and that's what we're working towards. We, we don't uh, know what fully happened to Jane or what, uh, whose hands and that's the object of our investigation is to get to the bottom of that. Have you found other things alongside the remains? There are some interesting or well, items that need to be analysed, uh, which I won't go into as to what they are, and, and they'll, they'll be worked on to help establish the facts around Jane. And they offered a re- reward. They did. They offered a fifty thousand dollar reward, I believe, uh, for information, which you know is sort of still sitting there, I suppose. What part did her jacket play in the investigation? So, on the night she went missing, Jane was uh, wearing a sort of quite striking looking large brown leather jacket with little tassels on it um, which has never been recovered so that would be sort of a key item that the police would be looking for wherever that jacket is presumably um, is with her killer. But because why? Because she was wearing it at the time and it wasn't discovered with the body? Correct. Oh mm. yes correct. Yeah. What made you decide to dedicate a book to her story? Um, I had met Jane's mother, Judith, sort of through my work as a court reporter in Auckland at the time, and she was very keen to discuss Jane's case with me, and we struck up a bit of a friendship, and I remember, you know, one afternoon, she kind of had just said, oh, I just wish somebody would, you know, write a book about all of this one day, because there was so much to it, um... And it sort of struck me that Jane's story, as well as, you know, what had happened to her, was obviously the biggest mystery, but it, it struck me that I was quite interested in what had, what her life had been like before she went missing and who she was and what had led to her sort of, you know, pursuing sex work. And so I was sort of a young, ambitious reporter and said to Judith, well, do you mind if I give it a go? Yeah. I'm talking to Kelly Dennett, uh, who's the journalist who's written a book about the disappearance, murder of Jane Furlong, uh, and they haven't so far identified her killer or haven't convicted her killer. Um, we're just talking about Jane's mother, who Kelly got to know a wee bit, and she had Jane's diary, is that right? Yeah, Judith had actually passed um, Jane's three diaries to Jane's best friend, Amanda. So Amanda's kept the diaries and... Um, I was sort of able to have a a bit of a read of them, I suppose. What was it like reading through the diaries of a person no longer alive? It was very sort of eerie and unsettling, actually, because mostly just because they looked like diaries that, you know, the user had sort of left the day before and um, reading through them, our handwriting styles were very similar and Hmm. they just looked like a typical, you know, teenager's diaries with love hearts all over them and pictures and drawings and things. And so it was a little bit unsettling. And, you know, to me, I think I sort of write about in the book my, I guess, um, sort of internal dilemma over whether I'm invading her privacy anyway by by reading her diaries. Um, But certainly uh, I got to know her a lot better through them, I suppose. You met Danny, her uh, boyfriend at the time. Yes, I did, Um, which I didn't expect to, actually. Danny had sort of been a bit of a a secretive character who'd kind of kept away from media attention. Um, So I was was really happy to be able to meet with Danny and, I guess, share the project with him and make sure that he sort of um, had as much a say in the book as, as anybody else. Did you learn anything interesting from him? I think that, um, I guess I had some ideas about how Danny would be. There had been a lot made of um, some violence in their relationship and I guess I wanted to give him a chance to talk about that. I mean, overall I found that I guess Danny was a perfectly pleasant 
person to me and I also thought that he'd been really profoundly affected by Jane's disappearance and um, I think I was perhaps taken aback by sort of how much he, he spoke about his love for her. I, I was, I'm not sure what it was that surprised me about that, but he's, he was certainly a little bit different to what I was expecting. So let's talk about suspects. Who are the most interesting ones? Um, I think the, probably the most interesting um, person of interest came forward while I was writing the book. During the course of the investigation, the police had identified an associate of Jane's, um, and during the course of their investigation, they had interviewed her best friend about him, and she had disclosed that he had raped her at um, one of the homes that they all used to frequent in the 90s. And um, during his rape trial, he sort of outed himself to jurors and said that he believed that he was a suspect in Jane's disappearance, um, which was an interesting admission. Uh, He was subsequently jailed for um, Jane's best friend's rape um, and has recently been released. But there's a couple of aspects of his um, association to the case which are interesting. His family had a batch at Port Waikato, where Jane was found and I guess he was in a dispute with Jane and her boyfriend Danny at the time. There was sort of a dispute over a vehicle and that dispute had led to an altercation which was leading to court action. And he knew Jane, he knew sort of where she worked and would have known her movements and, you know, he was a fixture in her life. So he was certainly a possibility, I suppose. He's the most interesting suspect or the most likely suspect in your opinion? That's a hard one. I mean, of, of the, I'm sure the long list, he's, he's certainly a strong possibility. I think the Port Waikato connection is, is really very interesting. And I remember um, one of the detectives that I spoke to a few years ago sort of said, you know, the key to this mystery is the location. Who would have taken Jane there? So um, his connection to Port Waikato was, was very interesting. But certainly there are other possibilities. It's possible that she jumped into a car with a client and, you know, was taken that way or who knows. Where is he now? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. He was recently released from prison during the coronavirus lockdown, so he could be anywhere. Uh huh. Are you hopeful that we might learn something more about this case that might lead to a conviction? Yeah, absolutely. I really strongly believe that there's, you know, potentially a few people out there who know exactly what happened to Jane and that the key to this mystery could be one of them just coming forward to say what they know about the case. Um, and I'm sort of, I guess, boisted by, you know, there have been a, a few cases recently where an arrest has been made, you know, decades later. So I think it's totally possible for it to be solved. Not tempted to uh, release your own podcast, Kelly. You know so much <laughs> about this. A few people have suggested it to me, but I, I think it would just be... Um, there would be so much work and, yeah, hopefully people would buy the book instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, in a piece for Newsroom, you you write about your conflicted feelings about winning that Niall Marsh Award and you write that you had, quote, murder mystery fatigue. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I think I meant at the time. I mean, researching Jane's life and her death, you know, it took years um, and it was... You know, the characters in her life um, were interesting people and I felt a real sense of duty of care to them. And I think the burden of writing about Jane and her disappearance and sort of feeling the sense of responsibility of it had had left me quite, um, I guess, tired in a way. And I'll always find the case especially interesting and I'll, you know, I'll always be writing about it. But I think after a couple of years of the publishing and and I guess feeling a sense of, I guess, perhaps disappointment that I hadn't found anything new or, you know, even solved it, um, I think I, I just felt a little bit fatigued. And so when I won the, the Naomash Award, which is amazing, it was incredible and I'm so grateful for it, I think I just thought, well, you know, but I didn't solve it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, how old would Jane be now in 2020? Uh, her birthday would be in September this year. I think she'd be coming up 45. Okay. Still young, mm. <laughs> says the 45-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what needs to happen for this murder to be solved, do you think? Well, I just think someone needs to, to get the guts to, 
you know, walk into a police station and say, this is, this is what I know. Um, I think it has to come down to that, really. You've been listening to Crimes NZ with me, Jesse Mulligan. You can find more episodes of this series on the RNZ Podcasts page. It's also on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you find your podcasts. Follow Crimes NZ so you don't miss an episode, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a rating so others can find it too. Once you've caught up on this podcast, try Fight for the Wild. It's a four-part podcast interrogating the plan to make New Zealand predator-free by 2050.